Okay, we've been talking about the past. Are you willing to also predict the future? Um, you said already that natural selection and drift is changing humans. Um, where are we going to be 10, 100, 1,000 generations in the future? Well, you know, clearly our environment will change constantly. And we will change it. And we will change it ourselves, the environment. So, so predicting future is like predicting weather. You can give a general idea, but you can't pinpoint exactly what will happen and when it will happen. Given that, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> so so if, if past is any indication, uh, you know, how many of the, uh, the variation we carry in our genomes is going to, which used to be detrimental, is going to become neutral because uh, it is not necessary anymore. Such a safe environment now. Yeah, such a safe environment that you do not need many of those things. You know, if we are only going to use one thumb to type on our smartphone, then clearly the other four fingers on both hands may become less useful. There are other things to do with fingers, but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the progress is in evolution of change is slow. Mm -hmm. uh, DNA mutations happen very, very slowly. They change in frequency very, very slowly. So here's a question I'm always asked. How long does it take? Um, for instance, there's a book about uh, saying lots of things have happened in the last 10,000 years and another book by people saying, we're pretty much the same as our Stone Age ancestors. Do you want to take sides in that debate? Well, 10,000 years is a very, very short time when it comes to the DNA. So for the DNA, 10,000 years, you will increase the uh, frequency of some mutations and decrease some others very mildly. But we have seen some specific things change. Yeah, you will. Whether it's ability to digest milk in adulthood or people making adaptations to altitude, um. So, in some cases, the, so it all depends on the amount of selective pressure. And so, if the amount of selective pressure is huge... Well, what's an example of high selective pressure or low? How do we measure that? Well, so I think uh, if you are in a higher altitude and uh, you have lack of oxygen and that really makes it difficult for you to breathe, the amount of selective pressure is tremendous. And I think that would mean that individuals who have the mutation would survive much better or at least give So that mutation offspring. will become more frequent very fast. Very fast. And this actually for high altitude for or hypoxia situations, now such mutations have been found in uh, birds and pigs. Oh, really? Not and just other, humans? Not just humans because really? they all coexist and everybody has same hemoglobin to, and uh, its partners. So some of those in the Andes and Himalayas just last five to 9,000 years. Is that right? Yeah. And so that's, but you know, in those cases, individuals who were there who did not have the mutation probably migrated out rather than died out. So it wasn't just selection, it was also migration. Probably it's migration because, you know, uh, the, in a sense, a sensible human, if I'm, they can't I'm, breathe, I'm breathing deeply right now. <laughs> a sensible human who can't breathe very well in an environment like that would leave the location. So, so my ancestors lived at sea level in the North Sea for the last thousands and thousands of years. And all I have to do is go up to Aspen, and I get short of breath. Do you think that people who lived at sea level for many, many, many generations are more likely to get uh, altitude problems than other people? I mean, that just seems natural. That uh, so I th essentially, there is a higher concentration of a specific type of mutation in higher altitude. Whether that frequency increased independent of migration, or whether that increased. Uh, you know, by, by negative selection against individuals who did not have that uh, mutation. So you still haven't described exactly what a human looks like in the year 20,000. Uh, uh, he or she will have glasses. <laughs> 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 they, they might, uh, or they may just be wearing visors with 3D <laughs> display in them. I mean, I, I think how we look like we hopefully we look very similar to now. So actually, we both know that the environment is changing, not just the external environment, but people are starting to make choices about what genes they want for their children. Yes. What do you think they're going to choose? Well, generally, uh, you know, people have a lot of vanity. So I think these might be the genes that are primarily for superficial traits. And rather than... Uh, so if people can find genetic collections that make kids attractive, those will be desirable. I would think that would be the easy bet.
So is it likely that we will find collections of genes that are highly correlated with attractiveness? Or is something like attractiveness just too complex? I mean, for height, for instance, how many genes does it take to predict how high you, tall you are? Oh, about 20,000. You know, <laughs> but, but I think aren't people already selecting for that when people have you know, artif uh, you know, in vitro fertilization, or when they have sperm donors, they look at all these phenotypes I don't think they. I don't think they get to see pictures of. But they, they do mm -hmm. get information on height and mm -hmm. color, and mm -hmm. IQ and other things. So yeah, they don't get a picture, but they do get a profile. So that's self breeding of a sort, which is still different from people choosing specific genes. Well, but I think that's uh, sort of a thing uh, we will have to find out what they will select. But you know, gene editing in that way might actually be a difficult thing still. I think so, yeah. yeah.